restaging of the musical Here Lies Love, this time on Broadway and with an all-Filipino cast, has been successful but also ridden with controversy. Rappler's own Ruben Nepales recognizes the artistry and the good intentions that went into this play about the so-called rise and fall of Imelda Marcos. But also writing in Rappler, the writer Eric Gamalinda argues that the problem with the disco music is Imelda herself. That despite being upfront about the abuses of Ferdinand Marcos, Imelda in the end, and I quote, becomes the true heroine. What should we make of all this? And what does it tell us about how the Marcoses, since at least the 1960s, have used culture and the arts to their advantage? Good evening. I'm John Neri, and you are in the public square. We are joined tonight on Zoom by attorney Ruben Carranza in New York, the transitional justice lawyer who, in holding the Marxists to account, has been critical of the musical. And here in the studio by Margie De Leon, Marguerite De Leon, who among other hats she wears in Rappler, is also editor for Life and Style and for Entertainment. Thank you, attorney Ruben and Margie, for joining us in the public square. Thank you. Good evening. Happy to be here again. Thank you. Attorney Ruben, my first question is for you. I, I haven't had a chance to see the play, but you have no? in the original version 10 years ago. What, what are your impressions of this musical? When I first saw it, well, but the only time I saw it, um, many years ago when it was off-Broadway at the public theater, I was disturbed. Mm -hmm. um, it was presented, of course, even at that time as a musical that was not so much critical of Imelda Marcos as much as um, the humanization of Imelda Marcos. And mm -hmm. it was expressed that way without any irony by its creator, um, mm -hmm. David Beard, mm -hmm. and by some of the cast. At that time, the cast was not um, the complete film cast has now. Mm -hmm. And like I said, it was disturbing back then because it was obviously written for American audiences. It was written in such a way that American audiences would be entertained by the idea of Imelda Marcos. And that's one of the problems of Here Lies Love. Mm -hmm. it, it presents the idea of Imelda Marcos in the minds of a white, wealthy, pop person like mm -hmm. David Beard. Mm -hmm. It does not present Imelda Marcos the way she could have been presented in a short two-hour format. Mm -hmm. And it trivializes much of what happened to Filipinos, including victims of torture, victims of extrajudicial killings and disappearances during the dictatorship, as much as all other Filipinos, victims of corruption of the Marcoses. Um, it trivializes Philippine history and presents it as entertainment while obviously trying to present Imelda as someone who is more than just a caricature of shoe collector and mm -hmm. dictator's wife, but someone who went through trauma in her childhood, mm -hmm. humanizes her or at least attempts to humanize her and never even considers the fact that asks itself whether there is a need to humanize Imelda Marcos. The Evita Peron uh, treatment. Um, Margie, uh, this is of course not a new mu musical, no. but this particular staging, what's new about this as far as, as the upper art, the, the theater craft? Uh, why, is, uh, why, why are a lot of people talking about this? Well, yeah, yes, it's not a new musical. I mean, it started in 2010 as a concept album. Mm -hmm. So uh, David Byrne of the Talking Heads and Fatboy Slim, mm -hmm. they created an album. So it wasn't really supposed to be like a staged musical. Okay. And then when they finally staged it uh, years ago, um, it, it didn't have back then a full Filipino cast that it does now. Yes. Full Filipino, well, fi full Filipino American yeah, Filipino, cast. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's the biggest difference um, with the staging now. Mm -hmm. That they're really mar they're really marketing it as um, 
all the cast and crew were Filipino Americans, mm-hmm. and this is uh, something that is truly Pinoy and something that we can all be proud of as Pinoy. So that's what they're marketing the the thing as, mm-hmm. and to some degree, uh, that is something that we can be proud of because it's it's a historic moment for mm-hmm. us to have the very first Broadway play that's all Filipino. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and then another difference that they uh, another addition that they made mm-hmm. um, for this particular uh, uh, show is they added more of the historical tidbits mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. like they added more of the footage of martial law mm-hmm. um, they tried to skew it more towards this is clearly um, an anti-marcos uh, play as mm-hmm. opposed to just the concept album from years back where okay. it was just all like um, all glitter and glam. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I honestly think that it is kind of like pang pinatong lang mm-hmm. um, yung, uh, what do you call this, the sociopolitical aspect okay. of it mm-hmm. as opposed to before. So, um, I feel like, honestly, like there's a disconnect because it was started with two white men mm-hmm. who just made this album and then, um, belatedly, mm-hmm. they just added like the more politically correct stuff okay. later on. So I, that's the difference. I, I want to get back to uh, some of the points that you already raised, not only Ben and Margie, uh, the, the issue of audience, who's watching, uh, who is this for? Also the issue of uh, artistic license. Can Filipino history only be written up uh, by Filipinos, no, for instance? But uh, Attorney Ruben, you, I, I want to focus on what you said about the musical trivializing the country's history and the Marcus's abuse of power. Uh, reading uh, Ruben Nepales' coverage, uh, it seems that they really made an effort to portray Marcos as the villain of the piece. And yet, Eric Gamalinda says at the end, you are left with this impression that Imelda is the heroine. Um, can you say more about that? Well, I think it's important to also remember this, that this these stories about Imelda Marcos and her supposedly impoverished, mm-hmm. relatively speaking, childhood mm-hmm. or teenagehood, um, mm-hmm. this isn't new. Uh, and, and, and here's the problem with that. Um, Imelda Marcos already did try to suppress Carmen Pedrosa's account of mm-hmm. you know, her childhood and living in a garage. But at the same time, they... They did not completely suppress it so that it, um, you know, was erased. Uh, they did attempt, and I, I recall reading an old, old column of Renato Constantino mm-hmm. during the first term of Marcos. Apparently, it was written where he already pointed out that Imelda Marcos's image makers were already trying to control the narrative, so that on one hand they portray her as wealthy and mm-hmm. educated and culturally sophisticated, but on the other hand, not entirely suppress this this background. Mm-hmm. And so the portrayal of Omelda by David Byrne in this musical isn't new. Um, the problem there is that his, his intention is to humanize Emelda Marcos by his mm-hmm. own admission, mm-hmm. which is why uh, Eric Domalinda comes to that conclusion uh, at the end of the musical. Mm-hmm. Um, the portrayal of Ferdinand Marcos as a dictator can't be any other way because he was a dictator. He was brutal. He was corrupt. Um, the focus here is on Imelda Marcos. And uh, you mentioned Evita Peron. Unlike Evita Peron, uh, even when you watch the both the movie and the musical involving mm-hmm. Evita, mm-hmm. It, it does show Evita's history of labor organizing. Mm-hmm. It shows her own history of being a dictator's wife. Mm-hmm. But those histories were at least true and carried on uh, in the course of Argentine history and, of course, made after she died. Mm-hmm. This one is different. Imelda is alive. Imelda's character uh, portrays only part of, of what supposedly happened to her. And like I said, whether it's necessary is one question. But at the same time, the, the, the idea that um, Imelda may have become what she is, what she is now, you know, corrupt, horrible person because of what happened to her, is it, 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 not, not, not only insults what she did 
to many, mm -hmm. to thousands of Filipinos, to millions of our people, because you cannot explain away the corruption and the brutality by pointing to some potentially even fictional account of Imelda Marcos. And it only contributes to the larger strategy of half-truths and total lies that the Marcos has subspread mm -hmm. and now have allowed them to come back to power. So the problem is, of course, timing, but it's not just about timing this musical. It's also the content of the musical itself. Attorney, uh, Jose Liana, the actor who plays Marcos in the musical, says the play actually smuggles in what he calls a Trojan horse of a message, you know, that uh, the Marcoses did wrong in the Philippines and so on. Are you saying that it's not, in fact, possible to perceive this Trojan horse of a message or to even let it enter the gates of Troy um, because the, the very framework is, uh, uh, works against it? I mean, when you're dancing under a disco ball while the stage is rotating underneath you, I don't know that you will be thinking about what kind of dictator Ferdinand Marcos was or whether Imelda Marcos, you know, is really beyond redemption. Uh, it, it's, it's Philippine history under a dictatorship presented as entertainment, not the other way around, where entertainment smuggles in Philippine history. Um, and, and that's part of the trivialization. That, that, that's, somebody else said this already, but, you know, disco cannot fix the distortion of our history being compressed in this way and being trivialized. Um, the, the, the human experience of, of torture and plunder should not be should not be presented like this. Um, Margie, I want to recognize the good intentions of the of the, of the cast and the and the yeah. producers no, that put up this uh, show again. Uh, but I want to ask: Is it a question of the artists mistaking intention for execution? That despite their best efforts, the ultimate effect is opposite of what they intended. Yeah, like um, throughout all the interviews of uh, of the cast and mm -hmm. crew. They all clearly mean well. Mm -hmm. Like they, they want to make sure that this is a story that Filipinos can uh, can grasp that 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 something very serious mm -hmm. and dire happened. But the project was flawed from the start because, like I said um, earlier, uh, it was a project between two white men. That was a concept album. That was disco. Mm -hmm. So um, the fact that um, they just added on to that project instead of starting from scratch, I think was like the greatest uh, mistake of, of this whole production. Um, maybe they could have uh, uh, reworked it a bit better. Mm -hmm. um, I understand that the disco aspect could be inserted there because mm -hmm. that, is, that was part of the whole Marcos oeuvre, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, uh, I think uh, for something as dire as that, as martial law, mm -hmm. um, maybe they should have taken a step back and looked at things from a more serious perspective instead of latching on to the power of that pop music um, project. This, this brings us back to the question of audience. No, yeah. I think uh, um, uh, these two white men okay, may <laughs> have had an American audience in mind. Uh, so I think the problem is those who know about Imelda, perhaps won't have their knowledge challenged. Yeah. But those who don't know anything about Imelda or indeed about the Philippines, they may end up with the wrong idea. Yeah, yeah. Hey, it was funny in 1970s, Manila or something yeah, yeah. like that. Do, do you agree with that? I mean, is that... Uh, can we worry that question of audience a bit? Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, um, I listened to a podcast recently of David Byrne talking about Mm -hmm. um, when he started the project. Mm -hmm. And when he was talking about Imelda, he was gushing about her. Mm -hmm. Like he was like, this, this woman is crazy and amazing. And uh, he, was, he was talking about her in superlatives in the sense that she was like a cartoon character. Mm -hmm. So I mean, because to, to an extent she is. Mm -hmm. So for someone who is not familiar with Imelda, it is so very easy to be enamored by her. Um, because we are also in this culture of um, as we're, we're, we like aspirational characters. Mm -hmm. We like 
um, rich characters who are excessive about their yeah their aspirational richness. excess. <laughs> yes, correct. So um, yeah, uh, uh, if you are not uh, aware enough of Philippine history, mm-hmm. it is very very easy for you to slip into that um, into that sense of actually liking her. Yeah, yeah. I mean. There is a word for for her and the spectacle right. she created, yeah. right? I mean, which is uh, email di- mm-hmm. email difficult, Diffic. right? Um, I'd like to ask both of you, attorney first, and then Margie. Uh, what? Let's go mm-hmm. back to the question of timing. All right. Uh, I'll put it this way: uh, Is it too early? <laughs> I mean, you have uh, I forget the title of the movie now. Uh, Sofia Coppola directed about um, Marie Antoinette. Maybe uh, it was Marie Antoinette. Antoinette. Yeah, it was, yeah. <laughs> there we go. Uh, yeah. And, you know, that, uh, in a way, that humanizes what happened to this uh, uh, French king's wife. Um, but after uh, uh, a remove of, what, a couple of hundred years? Yeah. Uh, like, is it too soon? Or it's, it's not a question of timing at all? Uh, may, maybe just to add to uh, this question, a third Ten years ago, when the musical was written, uh, they could say the rise and fall of Imelda. But today, the year 2023, I mean, she's a senate again. Her son is president of the Philippines. Uh, does that add anything to the to the musical? Well, well, timing is everything. But at the same time, in this case, timing is just one of the worst things about the musical. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously. It's being played at the time when Marcos, the Marcos family, um, thinks any disinformation or lack of information about their family uh, is helpful. And for a musical that oversimplifies what happened, trivializes the trauma of Filipinos, you know, it's as good as the Marcoses can want it to be. Mm-hmm. And What's worse, and I think Margie mentioned this already, the, the add-on of a film cast, it's, it, it adds insult to the injury because it, it's obviously brownwashing, Pinoy washing. You can call it many things. It plays on the Filipino, especially the film community, sometimes desperation for acknowledgement and representation in Western culture. And so... Filipinos who, who go there, many of them that I know, um, are happy, only happy to see being represented on stage by Filipino-American actors. Mm-hmm. On and, the great white fine, way. Mm-hmm. Except that they, yeah, they, they, I don't know that they would ever ask why a musical about Carlos Bulusan, for example, would that be possible? <laughs> mm-hmm. Why a musical about Filipino nurses would that be possible? Uh, why would a white man pick Imelda Marcos to feature in his own Broadway musical? So that it's the timing now, of course, is makes it even worse because he knows, um, the producers know, and some of them are films as well, that, that the Marcoses came back to power based on lies, based on corruption, based on what they did in their dictatorship. Um, perhaps you're right. Maybe they mistake their good intentions for the execution but i think they 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 ought to be better than that they ought to be more knowledgeable than that it there, there is a certain sense of responsibility for artists to consider when, when portraying the history of a country that is still suffering from the dictatorship they they went through and i i was interviewed by the New York Times about this and in mm-hmm. one of the points that I raised that never really got quoted, but I thought it was helpful to, to say. I, I quoted Bertolt, Bertolt Brecht, the, the German mm-hmm. anti-fascist mm-hmm. playwright, the musical writer, who said that it, it's not just to go, that the truth is belligerent, according to him, and it's important for the truth to go after not just the, the lies, but, uh, but to go after those who spread the lies. And spreading lies isn't just something you deliberately do. It's also something you reinforce. Mm -hmm. And this, the timing of this, reinforces the lies of the Marcos family. But maybe belligerence is not entertainment. 
uh, in the eyes of, you know, uh, theater goers. Uh, Margie, I want to go back to the question of timing. I mean, Attorney Ruben says, uh, it's unfortunate, uh, but it's only one factor. Uh, does this change how we perceive this particular play because it's being shown right now? Yeah. Or it's always been problematic? Um, I think... Yeah, it, it has always been problematic. I mean, the, the format of it, I suppose. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the gist of the story is that it humanizes Imelda. So that in itself is a problem. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, in terms of the timing, like I personally, when I found out that this was going to be staged on Broadway this mm -hmm. year, the only thing I could think of was like, why? Why now? <laughs> like, we're still reeling from what happened last year. We're mm -hmm. still reeling from what happened the past few decades, mm -hmm. you know, so um, I, I really, on a guttural level, like, I couldn't understand why, some, like, this project would come out um, so soon. Um, it also reminds me of, there's this new book that came out, um, it's a fiction, it's a novel mm -hmm. by Nathan Go. it's called Forgiving Imelda Marcos, yes. mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's about, uh, what do you call this, uh, Corazon Aquino is in a car with her driver and they're on their way to meet Marcos mm -hmm. and supposedly there's going to be like an interaction. And when uh, when Nathan Go was asked by, I think it was Variety, mm -hmm. um, in an interview, uh, like, aren't you worried that uh, you're propagating, uh, what do you call this? Mm -hmm. Aren't you worried that you're propagating um, um, or aggrandizing these two characters too much. And then he said, like, oh, when I write, I just want to be removed from um, what's happening in the Philippines right now. I just okay. want to focus on my fiction. I just want to focus on my characters. Mm -hmm. So I think that's another aspect that we have to look into, that because this is a fictionalized project, mm -hmm. um, like, people can so very easily say that, uh, what do you call this? Like, this is artistic license. That's right. Mm -hmm. So... Um, yeah, that's another issue that I have with it. Um, again, the question for both of you. I don't think David Byrne set out uh, to write the concept album uh, with Fatboy Slim and, and, and the play at the behest of the Marcuses. I mean, they, they had yeah. nothing to do with this, right? But you, we all know the Marcuses are adept at using culture and the arts to their advantage. Can we say that David Byrne and Fatboy Slim actually ended up playing the Marcus's game? Of course. And they knew that when they first came out with this. They, they, don't, they know that now when they're coming out with this under a Marcus Jr. presidency. I, artists like them need to be paid, need to be hired by dictators and, and corrupt government officials in different countries to be aware of their responsibility. Um, uh, you know, once you make a choice the way they did to mm -hmm. write about another country's history, um, they immediately accepted the burden of, of understanding yeah. the consequences of that. The first rule in the work I do as a human rights lawyer, the first rule for, for a lot of professionals, including doctors, is mm -hmm. do no harm. Mm -hmm. And that should apply to artists as well. Here they're doing harm. They never thought about it. RG, are we playing their game? <laughs> yeah, um, they, they fell for it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hook, line, and sinker. Um, uh, on a personal note, like I, I, I graduated from the Philippine High School for the Arts, okay. so um, which is part of the National Arts Center, which That's was right. which Imelda's Imel pet Imelda's uh, projects. Yes. Correct, that is Imelda's pet project. So um, there has always been this idea that uh, Imelda has always been a champion of the arts. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that's something that like we, we can't fault her for or something. Like mm -hmm. it's hard to criticize. Um, it also reminds me of, uh, back in 2003, there was this magazine called Flip. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember this. Mm -hmm. It was created by Jessica Zafra, right. the, the fictionist. And it was such a like, counterculture cool magazine. Mm -hmm. And one of its first uh, covers was Aimee Marcos mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. Satoru Ocampo right. and, um, uh, who was that? Uh, Teddy Boy Luxin. Okay. Yeah. 
So um, fast forward to 20 years later, <laughs> and um, Jessica Zafra was asked, like, how do you feel about the fact that you mm -hmm. kind of played into the Marcos, mm -hmm. uh, Marcos thing? And uh, interestingly enough, she said, like, the biggest mistake I did there was treating her like a human being. <laughs> So um, and and if yeah yeah go ahead attorney no no if I may if I may add yeah if I may add John it wasn't difficult for David Beer and Fatboy Slim or any of their mm -hmm. uh, white people rock artists to to know their responsibility because there was a group that already understood what kind of people Ferdinand and Imelda Marcos are with respect to using art using pop culture. Mm -hmm. um, to, to deodorize themselves. The Beatles refused to perform for them. They were coerced into performing. They refused to stay and bow to these mm -hmm. corrupt couple. And they left the Philippines in a hurry and vowed to never come back. And mm -hmm. they never did. Mm -hmm. And that's your example. That you, you they, they knew what was going to happen. They refused to take part in it willingly. And they left when it was being forced upon them. The Beatles. That's your example. And you know, who's David Byrne? He's not you know, he's not on the same level as they are, obviously, but you know, he, he should have known what he was getting into. And and what happened to the Beatles happened before Martial Law was uh, was imposed. Uh, this was still in the exactly. late sixties, right? Exactly. And, and, and it is a foreshadowing. And, and, and the fact that they, they yeah, and the fact that they were willing, they, they were beaten up by Marcos loyalists, they were hounded by police and Marcos tax collectors all the way to the airport, but they stood their ground and left. But Margie, as a writer, uh, as an artist, you would understand, uh, okay, Imelda Marcos is a larger-than-life figure, whether we like it or not. And sometimes you might need to uh, use a larger-than-life figure to work out certain uh, issues. Sure. Right? Uh, I, I, I do remember that one of the hit plays soon after the Edsa Revolution was a play called uh, Si Bongbong at Si Chris, which mm. was uh, an imagining of how these two children would meet. You know, and so on. Um, what are the limits to... I mean, Attorney Ruben already spoke about responsibility to do research, to, yeah. to do no harm, and so on. But... Artistic license is a, is a very has very wide latitude, right? I mean, right. Yeah. Where where did they go wrong here? In, do you think? I think um, it it was a lack of clarity. I think like when even when you take on a fictional project, when you take on an artistic work, mm -hmm. um, I am personally of the belief that the message should be uh, crystal clear, mm -hmm. no matter what kind of medium it is. So um, in this case, because you know, like. Patong patong yung yung uh, yung project. There, there was a lot of elements that were just kind of like mishmashed together at the mm -hmm. last minute. It seems, mm -hmm. um, uh, of course, then the messaging didn't come off, didn't come through as clearly mm -hmm. as opposed to other uh, uh, artistic works, wherein when you see it, the message is like completely transparent. Mm -hmm. So um, I feel like yeah, you can do all the research you want. You can put in as many, uh, what they call this, uh, uh, people to champion behind it. But as long as the work itself doesn't uh, make the audience come out with the same thought, uh, I think that is uh, uh, a weakness of and, and precisely because Imelda Marcos is larger than life, and we know about what she's done. Yeah. Uh, we've, we've endured that. Um, the, 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 the idea that... Uh, she can be turned into a vessel of ambiguity. Right, uh, yeah. Uh, like a historical uh, uncertainty. Um, yeah. Is, I think, uh, galling, right? Yeah. Um, Attorney Ruben, in your work on transitional justice, have you encountered any other authoritarian or dictatorial regime that used culture and the arts as a way to entrench themselves in power or to, uh, you know, extend the narrative? Or, or is it, more like a common thing. <laughs> I, I think it, it's a fairly common thing, but among certain types of dictators who want to be seen positively by the West, mm -hmm. 
um, there are Arab dictators who couldn't care less what the West thought about them. They also collected art. They also collected music. But mm -hmm. it was probably mainly for the, for the domestic audience. But for people like Imelda Marcos, uh, you know, she had, for example, one thing in common with the dictator of Iran, the, the Shah, mm -hmm. Mohammad Reza Pahlavi. Mm -hmm. They both knew Andy Warhol. <laughs> Imelda partied with Andy Warhol. Mm -hmm. Mohammad Reza Pahlavi actually invited Andy Warhol to Tehran who then did a portrait of his wife, uh, the Shah's wife, and mm -hmm. you know, uh, put that into some large collection of Western pop art that is now, up to now, hidden by the uh, Islamic government of Tehran in a basement somewhere. <laughs> and they, they, they both did this, tried to get American pop culture into their side so that they would be seen by the West as modernizing people. They would be seen by... American and European leaders as something, someone like them with the same kind of taste for culture and art. And it, it, would, it would help, hopefully in their heads, it would help these Western governments forget that these are brutal dictators, corrupt dictators, corrupt families who manage to stay in power by, in a way, the support of Western elites as well. I... I can think of a, an example uh, much closer to us in time. Uh, before the Syrian civil war, uh, the wife of President Assad was actually fated in uh, international magazines. Yeah. She's beautiful. She's you know learned. She's uh, cultured. Um, Became a UNESCO ambassador. Oh, I did not know oh, that. She did. Wow. <laughs> a UNESCO ambassador. So I mean, I guess an analog here would be, you know, what if. While apparently the Arab world has come to terms with the looming end of the Syrian civil war, uh, what if you know a group of people put up a play about the president's wife, you know, uh, turning the Syrian civil war into spectacle? Um, Margie, I remember that when Imelda Marcos turned eighty in two thousand and nine. Many newspapers, and there are some TV uh, networks also, mark the occasion. In 2009, uh, Bongbong Marcos had not yet uh, won a Senate seat. Mm. So maybe in the minds of uh, the editors at the time, the news directors, the Marcoses were a you know, local political power. Right? So anyway, it was on the front pages. You know, She got the celebrity treatment. Yeah, I'd like to... Get your thoughts. No? How has the media's growing dependence on celebrities helped to normalize the Marcoses? Um, like what I said earlier, like the aspirational aspect mm -hmm. of celebrities now. Before, um, like uh, you, uh, celebrities had to have a certain dignity about them. I guess, <laughs> like back in old Hollywood, like they had to not be as not have like messy personal lives. Like all that was kept. Um, um, under under wraps, but now celebrity uh, the celebrity culture now is everybody's a mess. Everybody's messy. Like uh, what do you call this? Everybody has their uh, what do you call this um, scandals, mm -hmm. and and they're all kind of humanized in a way. So they're aspirational, but they're also like messy humans at the same time. <laughs> So I think that that like recently that kind of celebrity culture has helped the Marcoses mm -hmm. because they have that glamour. They also have that well, I wouldn't say messiness, like they're just downright evil, I guess. <laughs> um, Which but, creates its own mess, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um so that kind of celebrity culture we have now where we're so eager to see a car crash, yeah. I guess, mm -hmm. um has really helped the Marcoses because love them or hate them. We just love to watch them mm -hmm. and see where they go. Uh, yeah. Attorney, uh, would, you, would you say, uh, would you agree with the assertion that maybe the game is being a celebrity? And the Marcoses knew that way back in the 1960s. I mean, uh, definitely Margie was too young for this. But in the 1960s, the Marcoses used to style themselves as the JFK and Jackie Kennedy of, uh, of Asia. Because they were a young couple, she was supposedly, they were, you know, they struck a, uh, an outstanding figure and so on and so forth. 
Um, was that the game all along? Uh, turn them into celebrities and maybe convert that uh, celebrity into political power. Oh, uh, sorry, uh, you're muted. That, yeah, that, that's one way to put it. Uh, in their case, however, being becoming and turning themselves into celebrities what was at the expense of mm -hmm. the Filipino people. And more importantly, it's, it, this is the kind of celebrity culture that literally money can buy. And so a large part of it is, of course, corruption on the side of the Marcoses. But another part of it is, is capitalism. Uh, the commodification of culture allows mm -hmm. dictators to buy culture. And dictators buy culture with money they steal. So whether it's the Marcoses going into the United States during the dictatorship being celebrated by the same elites who sell culture to them, uh, whether it's you know, New York Times mm -hmm. coverage or Donald Trump attending their parties, um, the Marcoses knew they could buy into the American cultural elite's circle. And, of course, part of that buying included buying buildings in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. um, the Marcoses also knew that image making wasn't just for the Western elite to eat and consume. By showing that Western elites consumed the images they were making to Filipinos, mm -hmm. they also knew that Filipinos would, would lap it up, would, would see the Marcoses as their representation abroad. And that's the same thing that Filipino American audiences think they will see when they go to Broadway, watch Here Lies Love. They will see themselves represented without thinking too much about exactly how they are represented. The same way Marcos and Imelda went abroad, they were represented Filipinos and Filipinos. Many uh, forgot exactly how they ended up there at what cost and at whose expense they were turning themselves into celebrities. This has been a fascinating conversation and I feel we can go on for another hour, but uh, uh, that's the time we have. Thank you, Attorney Ruben Carranza in New York and Marguerite Margie de Leon Thank here you. in the studio with me in Rappler. Um, this is a fascinating conversation and yet another reason why we need a free and robust public square. Again, Tony Ruben, Margie, many thanks. That's it for us tonight. As always, the next step for engaged citizens is to take a more active part in rebuilding our democracy. See you in the public square. This is John Neri. Thank you and good night.